when you were diving into atheism, I guess, what are the main things, the key things that brought you to atheism and made you question God and I guess the Bible and just, you know, in general? When the rationality came in, I viewed like the concept of suffering, for example, was a big factor. The concept that we don't need uh, God in order to view morality, because obviously in the uh, Greek philosophers, you just needed the Platonic forms in order to determine what good and evil is. You know, they're out there. I don't, why would I need a God? Uh, the contradictions that I felt that was in the Bible were, you know, the Jesus uh, birth from Matthew and Luke, which with the concept of Matthew being that he, he was born uh, during the last years of Herod, King Herod. But then in the gospel, of Luke, he was born under the first census under the governor, Quirinius, who was a governor at that time. So I saw that as very contradicting. Why is it that, you know, there were several women watching the resurrection of Jesus, but yet there is one woman only recorded in the gospel that was seeing. So these types of uh, contradictions and skeptics have pointed out so many through, you know, reading books from uh, Dr. Kuhns all the way to Alvin Plantinga, they, these uh, scholars of philosophy got me away from atheism, especially with the objective moral value, causation. Yeah, and so actually I do find that really interesting too, if we could maybe briefly even go into those two, so the objective moral value argument and then the causation one. Uh, even the most skeptics, I would say, have a form of causation, even those who are skeptic to Christianity. They're the ones who are the most prevalent when it comes to causation, because obviously they're always, they're always trying to figure out what the cause of something is. Even the perspective of people who are want to seek knowledge, you have they're always searching for the cause of something. Even now, whenever they're trying to figure out what is the cause of the universe, you know, is it a string theory? Is it a multiverse? It is, and so and so. And even if they find some form of knowledge, they try to say, well, what caused that? Yeah, well, my name is Edgar Cardenas, just a normal historian guy trying to um, study theology, history, and philosophy in my spare time. Uh, gone through many denominations within Christianity as well as, you know, atheism. And right now I'm in the church, so, you know, pleasure. Yeah. Because originally the Pentecostal church uh, started in the early 1900s and the Azusa Street Revivals in California, which was a church that was uh, a Methodist, very similar. But I didn't get into Methodism till way later. Uh, so I was born in a Pentecostal church. My mom forced me to be uh, going to, you know, church, reading the Bible. You know, as a Protestant, you view the Bible as being the highest authority. I think until I was about 18 or 19 is when I started getting interested in uh, the concept or the denomination of Baptist more specifically Southern Baptist, because there's different denominations within Baptist. Um, mostly I got into a group called the BSM, Baptist Student Ministry. They taught me the concept, which was very different soteriologically speaking, than that of the Pentecostal, which was the concept that maybe some of the viewers know is called once saved, always saved. It's the fact that a person could receive salvation once and never lose it. So... You have to say certain prayers. You have to say the Lord's Prayer. After that, you are saved. Uh, so I had a roommate, very interesting, who was Catholic, who was telling me about the church and everything. Um, gave me a little bit of, of uh, nuance about the Catholic church. Then I started getting interested in, in, in church history. But at the same time, uh, one of the people who was in the BSM was a Calvinist. Very, I got very interested in Calvinism. So started reading the Westminster Catechism, the London Baptist Conference, you know, started reading works of John Calvin as well. So started reading Ephesians, Galatians, things that, you know, many Calvinists would point to in order to have their doctrine based on the Bible. So the whole concept of the tulip argument, which is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. All that was something that I believed in for a while until I saw a commentary of John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodist, going back to, you know, again, uh, Methodism, his comment on, on the verse of shipwreck your faith. So 
from a Calvinist perspective, it's a little bit odd that a that an individual person could shipwreck his faith. Obviously, those who are elected are in the boat, but if you could shipwreck your faith, that means you could lose your salvation. Kind of made me question um, Calvinism, but also the perspective that you know God elects certain individual people for salvation, and those He also elects people who to go to hell, which I find that very philosophically flawed in the sense where if you say that God is a righteous, a fair God, why would he just predestine certain individual people to hell and certain people to heaven? Mm, so that kind of, yeah. yeah, no free will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that kind of made me question a lot. And especially going against the hard deterministic concept of soteriology that is found in Calvinism, where he would God would have like everything would predetermine everything, even your actions. It's a little bit odd for me. Got interested in Anglicanism for a while because Anglicanism, in a sense, has their own form of liturgy that is found within the early church, very similar to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox. And to an extent, I had problems with having a leader to tell me what to do other than just, you know, look at tradition or just look at uh, scripture. I started fading away from my faith starting getting away emotionally speaking from prayer and so forth and just kind of stopped believing basically because I didn't feel God. I started getting interested in, in atheism and so forth. So at that moment, I was um, reading books, you know, not books from the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, but books such, you know, from John Parzar, Frederick Nietzsche, Bernard Russell, and even non-atheists who wouldn't be considered Christians like Immanuel Khan, David Hume, and so forth. I also uh, studied scripture as well. You know, why doesn't uh, certain things say in Matthew, but not in Luke? Why is it that there's different birth narrations in, in Matthew and in Luke? But what got me back to the faith from, an, from the atheistic point of view is mainly two things. One was philosophy, studying, you know, the uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, studying people such as, you know, <clears throat> uh, philosophers from the modern times who were considered Christians. And even looking at biblical scholars trying to tie in uh, different uh, gospels in order to see that they don't contradict themselves, but rather they, they harmonize. Uh, the other perspective is objective moral value, which is something that, you know, every human being has to have in order to dictate something to be good or evil because obviously if morality is not objective it would be subjective then who is the one who determines morality is it humans or is it through evolutionary naturalism and if it's by humans well everything's very subjective obviously because throughout the history of time different people had different views of um, morality also the fact that if you're saying that naturalism is the foundation of morality, uh, naturalism always changes. One um, argument made by Alvin Plantinga, who was a Christian philosopher, he says that evolution and naturalism contradict themselves because if, for example, naturalism is correct when it comes to the moral issue and evolution ties with naturalism, then if 50 years later, we have a different perception of morality, that means naturalism itself always changes. And then 50 years later, something changes and then so and so. So naturalism and evolution itself always contradicts itself. And by the naturalist, they would tend to say that through evolution, we adapt a better way of morality. But if that morality always changes or if that morality to us seems much more harsh or more cruel, then that means that evolution and naturalism contradict themselves. So therefore naturalism wouldn't be a factor of morality. Now, the other view is called platonic form, where it is, you know, even stated a little bit by the 